If you're with us for the first time, uh, we're in the second week of our study. We're calling it Equipped, Ready for Battle. This is a series on spiritual warfare, and I know I scared some people to death last time, but that's okay. Uh, it's okay to be scared, but you got to understand, and I'll share some of this today. We know how this is going to end, and so we don't have to be scared. But here's the problem. Most churches never discuss this topic. And so we're talking about a topic you're not going to hear discussed in probably 95% of the churches in America, but this is a real issue, and especially an issue, it seems like, at this time in our culture and our society, because I, I just think there are things taking place, and I shared it with you last time, that would tell us it's a good time to study this. And if you were here the first week, I told you, I believe Satan would love nothing more than to do anything he can possibly do to keep you from being here and hearing what we're going to talk about. And I'll tell you why. Satan doesn't want to get exposed. I mean, Satan is kind of like Rodney Dangerfield, okay? Uh, he gets no respect. You know, he flies under the radar because in our culture, we have taken Satan and almost made him into a cartoon character. You know, he got a red outfit on and red pointy tail and some little red horns. He's got a red pitchfork. And we usually see him in cartoons and we don't really take him seriously. And I will tell you, Satan loves that. Satan loves that. And as a result, there may be some of you sitting in this room this morning and you may be under, and just stick with me this morning, you may be under Satan's influence in your life and you don't even realize it. In fact, you may be thinking, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm immune to that. But what we're gonna find is that's not necessarily true. In fact, let me show you something. Uh, if you have your Bible this morning, John chapter eight, if not, you can open the app. All the verses are on the app, except some, uh, I woke up Friday morning at 2.15 and I thought there's some stuff I'm leaving out of this. And so there is some stuff in this this morning that's not on the app, but I'll try to make it clear so you can write it down when you want to. I want you to see something that Jesus said in, in, in John chapter eight. Uh, Jesus has just finished teaching. Let me give you the setup. And in the audience that day are some Jews who have become followers. In other words, they've followed Jesus. They've listened to him teaching. And I don't think we realize this sometimes. But they, even as Jews, came to the conclusion, this dude's the Messiah. This dude is the Son of God. And so they have begun to follow Jesus. And so he's teaching them. And when he finishes teaching, he turns his attention to these new Jewish followers. And he makes a statement that we're very, very familiar with. John chapter 8, verse 31. This is what he says. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, that's very familiar. We've heard that statement, right? But I want you to notice their response in verse 33. They answered him. Now, these are the Jews who are new followers of Jesus. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. And I pointed out they have been slaves to everyone, right? They were slaves in Egypt for 430 years. They, they were slaves to the Assyrians. They were slaves to the Babylonians. They were slaves to the Chaldeans. Even as they're making this statement, they're under Roman rule. They're basically slaves now. And they're saying, we've never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? But notice Jesus' response in verse 34. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, let me just ask you without a show of hands, anybody in here sin? I think we all sin except Marge, except Marge. <laughs> I'm going to have to put Marge in time out. That's why we, <laughs> that's why we saved that space over there. That's Margeville right over there. Okay. But think about this. Jesus says, anybody who sins is a slave to sin. Let me, let me put it another way. Anyone who sins is in bondage to sin. That's what Jesus is saying. But notice the good news in verse 36. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So what he's saying is, even as a follower, you can be a slave, you can be in bondage to sin. Now, since, since some of you still don't believe me, what I wanna do is I wanna address this question, begin by addressing this question this morning. Is it possible for a Christian to be under the influence of a demon? Is it possible? So we're gonna talk about this. Is it possible to be in bondage? I wanna answer that by uh, looking at a story. It's a familiar story. It's in Mark chapter five, verse one. Uh, by the way, I just, we were supposed to go to Israel in, in November and because just there's just been kind of some weird stuff going on there and it, people were kind of slow signing up. So I've pushed it off till next November. And I just talked to my guide this week. One of the places that we're going to visit is where this story takes place. 
the Gerasenes. And let me just read it to you. We'll be there next November. It says, Mark chapter five, verse one, they went across the lake. This is the disciples with Jesus to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit. That's one of the ways that the Bible refers to someone who has a demon. He came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tomb. So think about this. He lived in a cemetery and no one could bind him anymore, not even with the chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, Why do you, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. Now we know right away that this is not the man that is speaking. This is the demon speaking through the man because Jesus isn't going to torture anyone. But by the way, they recognize Jesus for who he is, Jesus, the son of the most high God. Verse eight, for Jesus has said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. By word, Legion in those days was a Roman word that it referred to a battalion of soldiers. Literally the number was 6,826 soldiers made up a legion, 6,820. So the corporate name of these demons they took on was legion, legion. And we know that there were at least 2,000 of them, and I'll show you why. Then it says in verse 10, he begged Jesus, by the way, uh, 2,000 demons could fit on the pin of a head. So that's not a problem for them. They begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding on a nearby hillside. By the way, uh, demons don't have a body but they prefer a body. Uh, in this case, it was pigs. By the way, that tells me what I've always suspected. I've had a couple of dogs. I suspect it had a demon. <laughs> I have a cat I know for sure was demon possessed, right? But they prefer a body, okay? It says, a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number. So we know there were at least 2,000 demons, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. Verse 15, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. You would think they would be happy but it says they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. You would think they would be begging him to do seminars. Like, how, do, you know, how, do, how does this happen? Verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him go, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell uh, the Decapolis. By the way, the Decapolis is a metropolitan area. Deca means 10, uh, polis means metropolitan. So it's basically an area made up of 10 Greek cities, which would explain why they were raising swine, okay? So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. So understand, this is an example in the Bible, one of many, and I'll give you several more. This is one example of a man who was demon-possessed, but yet he gets free. But what I want you to see is that there's some things we can learn from this story in regards to the overall topic of demon possession and believers. And that's the question we want to address. So here's the first thing I want to say. Demons really do exist. You have to believe that. They really do exist. The word demon appears in the Bible 80 to 82 times, depending on your translation. It appears in the Gospels 61 times. There are eight writers who wrote the books, the 27 books of the, of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, Jude, and the writer of Hebrews. Every one of those writers, except the writer of Hebrews, talks about either demons or Satan, and most of them speak of him in great, great length. But not a one of them leaves out the topic of an evil supernatural being. 
By the way, let me just mention something here. One of the reasons that Jesus mentioned demons so often, or one of the reasons it's mentioned so often in the Gospels, let me put it that way, is because no one really had authority over demons until Jesus came. But when Jesus came, he had the authority. And so when he came, he immediately began to confront and to address the problem of demonic strongholds and demonic bondage. But my point is simply this. Demons really do exist. And let me just say, if you don't believe that, you've got to ignore a whole lot of the Bible. And you've got to ignore a lot of the ministry and the teachings of Jesus. Let me just give you some examples. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with the word, and he healed all the sick. Matthew 9, verse 32. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not walk was brought to Jesus, and when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Matthew 17, verse 18. Jesus rebuked the demon And it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Mark 3, verse 14. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that they might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Mark 6, verse 12. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Mark 16, verse 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. There's a lot of talk about demons in the Bible. By the way, let me just say this. There are two groups of people that Satan absolutely loves. One would fall into the category of skeptics, and one would fall into the category of those who are superstitious. There are a lot of Christians who see a demon behind every bush. I mean, demons are responsible for everything. If you get sick, if it's a demon. If you have a flat tire, it's a demon. They see a demon behind it. That would be someone who falls into the category of superstitious. And then there are people who really don't believe that demons exist today. They would fall into the category of the skeptics. Now, let me tell you, Satan loves both groups because both groups are deceived. And I'm pretty confident that both of those groups are represented here this morning. In fact, some of you are thinking this right now. This is really a stupid topic to be talking about. There's so much in the Bible. Why are we wasting our time on this? Some of you are thinking, thank you, Mike. You finally got to the good stuff, right? So there's this. Th- so if either one of those groups describe you, you're either a skeptic or you, you are superstitious, what you need to do is you, you need to try to come to the center. You need to try to get some balance. Years ago, I was in a ministerium in California with Chuck Swindoll. Maybe you've read his books or you've heard him uh, on the radio. One, I think one of the greatest Bible teachers I've ever heard in my life. But I was just chatting with him one day at lunch, and I said, Chuck, what is the key to the Christian life? And he said, balance. You get out of balance in any area of your Christian life, you're going to be messed up. So if you are an extreme in one of these areas, you need to come to, we're not skeptics, but we're not superstitious. As believers, we don't have to be afraid of Satan. We don't have to be afraid of his demons, but we don't deny their existence. So understand this topic that we're talking about, this is a real topic. Now here's here's the good news in case you have to leave early, okay? Jesus came to set us free. He came to set us free. Uh, I had This was a five-week series, and I, I reduced it to four weeks, and that's why I woke up at 2.15 Friday morning to try to get two into one because this is a heavy topic. But over the next two weeks, we're going to talk about how do we actually get free. And I'll go ahead and tell you now, and I'll share with you in a minute. A lot of you, you are under the uh, influence of a demon because of things that you have experienced emotionally in your life. And Satan has got a foothold in your life because of that. So we're going to talk next week. How do you get free? Because I want you to understand Jesus came to set you free. But I will tell you this. You will never get free if you don't realize that you are in bondage and that you need to be delivered. Let me try to put it this way. Sometimes as Christians, um, we struggle with weaknesses that we need to be discipled through. That is the process of discipleship. It's it's conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter two. You'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, we take off the lies that we believe that have shaped how we think and our behavior in life, and we replace those lies because they don't line up with the scripture of truth, with the truth of God's word, and we get set free. So some of the stuff we struggle, they are weaknesses. 
They're just weaknesses. And we just need to be mentored. We need to be discipled through those things. But sometimes those struggles are a result of you being in bondage and you need to be delivered. And that means that the answer isn't just discipleship and it's not just deliverance, it's both. And so don't get upset when I tell you that you, you might struggle with this problem of having some bondage in your life because Jesus came to set you free. He came to take care of that problem. And so the only people who can't get free from bondage are people who just refuse to admit that they are in bondage. But if you will admit it, if you will acknowledge it, you're gonna be set free. But I want you to understand something. Demons really do exist. Here's the second thing. Demons really do enter people. Uh, John chapter 10, verse one, uh, Jesus is speaking. He's teaching one day. And he says, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Now, this is what Jesus was saying. He was saying, the thief can get in. He can't get in through me, but he'll do everything he can to find a way to get in to the sheep. Verse 10. And then he says this, the thief comes only. Literally, it says this, the thief does not come except. That's what the Greek says. The thief comes only, does not come except to kill and steal and destroy. So Jesus was saying this, every time Satan shows up in our lives, he's showing up either to steal from us or to kill us or destroy us. He is absolutely vicious. He never takes a day off. He never has a moment where he feels kind of sorry for you and a little empathetic and backs off. He is re absolutely relentless. So here's the question. Can a Christian be demon-possessed? But to answer that question, I have to explain the term demon-possessed. First of all, uh, we have the New Testament. There are some original manuscripts that were found. They have been translated into what we now have today as the Bible. By the way, they are incredibly accurate when compared to the original manuscripts. But I want you to understand, in the original manuscripts, there is no such word as demon-possessed. I think this is probably the best the translators could do with the term. The word is literally demonized. Demonized. Not demon-possessed, demonized. It's not even an English word. In fact, the Greek word for demon-possessed comes from two words, demoni, which obviously we get demon, and then zoni, which means to possess. So you got demon and you got possessed. But to really understand the term for demon-possessed or demonized, you have to understand what the word possess means. And in the Greek, if you wanted to use the word possess, there were two different words you could use for possess. The first one was it meant ownership. I possess this car. I possess this phone. That's not the word that's used here. The Greek word zonai, which means possess, means to gain power over or to gain control over or, 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 or to, to gain literally one place I saw mastery over. So here, here is a definition for demonized. To be under the power or mastery or control of a demon in an area of your life. Let me read that again. To be under the power or mastery or control of a demon in an area of your life. Let me show you an example. Matthew chapter 20, uh, 12, verse 22. It says, Then they brought him, Jesus, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him. So here we have a situation. There's a guy, he's under the controlling power of a demon, and as a result, the demons have caused the condition of one, him being mute, another one, him being blind, but when the demon was cast out, the infirmities left. In other words, the demon lost his ability to control this area, these areas of this man's life. So let's go back to our original question. Can a Christian be owned by a demon? Can a demon possess you? Well, the answer is no. If you are a Christian, you belong to God. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, you are not your own, right? You are bought with a price. You belong to God. But that brings us to another question. Can a Christian be under the control of a demon? And the answer to that question is yes. But don't think of it in terms of being possessed by a demon. Think of it in terms of you possessing a demon. In other words, it's not the demon possessing you, but you actually possess the demon. Now, let me just give you some examples. Say you're a Christian and you've been a Christian for years. 
Is there an area of your life, even after you've been a Christian for years, is an area of your life that you just can't seem to get victory over? Is there an area of your life where you feel kind of hopeless, uh, maybe kind of powerless? Is there an area of your life that you have confessed over and over and over and over again? And you've said, God, please forgive me. I promise you, I will never do it again. And you still find yourself doing it over and over and over again. If that sounds like something going on in your life, here's my advice to you. Wake up. You're in bondage. Quit hiding behind the excuse that, you know, I just have a weakness in this area. You've had it for 20 years. That's not a weakness. That's bondage. Let me give you an illustration. When I lived in California, one Thursday morning, I called home back here to talk to my parents. And uh, they had gone to midweek prayer meeting. How many of you, how many of you grew up Baptist? You know what midweek prayer meeting is? See, by the way, Baptist churches are deacon possessed, not demon possessed, but it's very, very similar, okay? They had come home from midweek prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and they said, Mike, when we walked in, there were some guys robbing our house. Well, my parents, they're in their late 70s, early 80s, and we lived in a tough part of Durham, but at this point, man, we'd had bars on the windows, we had, but they still came in, and someone had broken in, and literally were in the process of robbing their house. And I said, what did you do? They said, we just started screaming, and praise God, they ran out the back door. And of course, I gave him the big pep talk. You're going to get killed. You're going to walk in. You got, we, you've get, we could not get him to move. You've got to move. You, you're going to walk in. Somebody's going to shoot you one night when you come. But anyway, here's my point. There was a thief in their house. Now, here's the question. Did that thief own the house? No. But the thief was in the house, and he had control over the house until they ran the thief out of the house. But I'm telling you this, if they would have allowed the thief to stay in the house, Jacques here today, he's been in law enforcement, what would they do? They would, they would steal, they would kill, and if necessary, they would destroy. In the same way, and I'm just saying this as a friend, some of you have a thief in the house. You got a thief in your life. And he's going to have control over you until you drive him out. But I'll tell you that as long as he stays, he's intent on stealing and killing and destroying you. Now, let me, this is what I added this week. So let me just switch gears a little bit. How does it happen? How do you actually end up with a demon? How does that even happen? Three things, and, and this is probably worth writing down. The first is what I call the realm of contact. And I'm going to say a little bit about all, more of these things next week. When you think of the realm of contact, there's the eye gate, things like the ear gate, uh, as I said, emotions. For example, uh, the eye gate allows certain things into our souls. There's literature that we read. There's pictures that we watch. There's movies that we see. There's video games that we play. Uh, there's pornography for some individuals. So you've, you've got the eye gate. The ear gate allows messages that often are conveyed through uh, some type of music, uh, some type of speech. Um, last weekend, my son was here visiting, my, actually my parents, and we got to hang out with them. In fact, I brought two of my granddaughters to the, to the pool party last Sunday, but one actually turned 16 today. And as we were driving around, uh, it was me and Shannon and my two granddaughters, and the eight-year-old threw the 16-year-old on the bus and says, she listens to music she shouldn't listen to. <laughs> By the way, the funniest thing in the world was to hear my eight-year-old granddaughter call Shannon, Grandma. <laughs> hey, Grandma. I'm like, oh, this, like, you can't make this stuff up. But anyway, anyway, neither here nor there. But hey, I got some joy out of it. But anyway, there was a conversation that then took place between Shannon and Olivia about what she's letting into her mind. And she was listening to some, you know, some rap music. It's pretty brutal, inappropriate. And she says, I just like it for the beat. And so Shannon's looking up on her phone and she said, well, you know, you can find clean versions of the song. Why would you listen to the bad version when you could listen to the clean version? It takes out all the profanity and da-da-da-da-da. 
But what I was trying to explain to her then is when we're constantly letting it in, it becomes a part of our mind. It becomes a part of our thinking. So you got you got you got the eye gate. You got you got the ear gate. Uh, when it comes to the emotions, one of the most common ways of contact is through curiosity. Things like Ouija boards, things like seances, things like fortune telling, things like horoscopes. By the way, let me just throw this out there: the person who wrote the Exorcist believed in demon possession. In fact, uh, the entrance of the demon into the main character began by playing around with a Ouija board. Something that many people consider, again, fun, enjoyable, simple, curious, harmless, right? So let me just say something. Don't ever forget this, okay? When you are in enemy territory, regardless of why you are in enemy territory, you are still in enemy territory. Satan doesn't care why you're there. You may just be at a party saying, man, I saw this on the Housewives of Orange County or something. Let's try to have a seance and see what happens. All right, what do you mean you got a Ouija board? Let's see if that really, really works. He doesn't care why you're there. You may just be there to have fun. You may just be there to be curious. You may just go get your fortune told because you think it would be kind of a cool thing to do. But I'm telling you, you will come under attack because you are in enemy territory. It's like when you cross the demilitarized zone in a war. They don't care why you're there. You may just be lost. You may be picking flowers. But you're going to come under the attack of the enemy. But every person has a weakness. Every one of us has a weakness in the realm of contact. You know your weakness. Guess what? Demons know your weakness too. I'll give you an interesting situation. Paul was in the city of Seneca and he addressed the demons in a man and the demon spoke and this is what the demon said. Jesus we know, Paul we understand. These are the demons. We got Paul's number. We understand it. We know what makes him tick. So don't think for a moment that demons don't understand you. They, they know your weakness, okay? They know your realm of contact. Here's the second stage, the point of entry. Now, whether we realize it or not, every day we are constantly exposed to the satanic world system. You cannot escape it. It's kind of like trying to live in a world without germs. You, you, just, you just can't do it. You go to work, in some ways you're exposed to it. You go play, in some ways you're exposed to it. You go watch TV, you go to the movies, you're exposed to it. I, I went to Netflix this week and just typed in, you know, the search, occult. This is why it came up. And this is just a small percentage. The Pope's exorcist, the worst witch, the good witch, the little witch, the witcher, always a witch, charmed, Satan slaves, satanic stories, satanic panic. And our curiosity, it provides an entry. But here's the other one, and we're going to really address this next week. It's also uh, possible to give demons a point of entry through our emotions. Let me show you an example. Ephesians chapter four, Paul is writing to the Ephesians. This is why it's such a big deal. This is the most practical part of his book. And this is what he says in verse 25. In your anger, do not sin. In other words, we're gonna be angry. But he says, don't sin and be angry. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And I used to think, well, that's, you know, if you live in Alaska, you can be angry for a long time because the sun doesn't set for a long time. It makes you want to move to Alaska. But I don't think that's what Paul is saying. I think he's saying, keep a short account with anger. Sheep accord okay, so he says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. But notice this next phrase, and do not give the devil a foothold. You know what Paul's saying? That it is possible to be so angry about a situation and just refuse to get over it and let it go that you can actually open the door for demonic activity in your life. And you know what? I've seen that. But you know what anger, by the way, this is what happens with people that are angry. I'm not going to talk about it anymore because everybody tell, they're telling me, I tell somebody why I'm so angry. They say, you ought to just get over that and let it go. So you know what you do? You push it down, you suppress it. Do you know what happens when you suppress anger? It becomes depression. It becomes depression but it gives Satan a foothold in your life. Now we're gonna deal with this next week because a lot of us, a lot of us have, if we're in bondage, probably a lot of it has to do with emotional hurts and all in our past where we just haven't processed them and dealt with them. So I'm gonna talk about how to get freedom from that next week. But understand there's the realm of contact, then there's the point of entry. And then the third stage is the inward hold. This is when an individual actually comes under the control or the power of a demon. 
And I've got to tell you, and some of you, you know this now, but you may not know what the source is. When they're there, they will wear you out. It's interesting. Demons are described several different ways in the Bible. Sometimes they're called snakes and scorpions. I'm going to show you a passage in just a second. But there's one place where they're called wolves, several places, actually. And this is very complicated. And, and I almost did a lesson. I was going to share some of it next week. This actually goes back to the Old Testament Chaldeans. And Paul talked about beware of the Chaldeans in the book of Acts. Well, they had been out of existence for hundreds and hundreds of years. Really, he was referring to demons. But he talks about wolves when he's talking about the Chaldeans. This is what he said in Acts 20, verse 29. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Now, let me just ask you a very simple question. Do you really believe that Paul is talking to these Christians about literal wolves? No, he's speaking about demons. He says they're like wolves. They're absolutely vicious. I love to watch the Discovery Channel. I am a little bit nerdy in that way. And I love all the Alaska shows. But, I, you know, they'll talk. I remember one day there was this lady. She's a tough chick. And she's living in Alaska all by herself. And she went to camp to do something. And every day she got up and about off about a, a, you know, a few hundred yards, there was a wolf watching her. Just watching her. And they looked so cuddly and so nice. But she knew exactly. She, he's learning my routine. He's looking for a point when I'm weak. When Shannon and I were in Montana in June, I took her horseback riding one day up in the mountains and we came across a pretty fresh kill of a caribou as we were riding. And I said, what took it down? And the guy said, wolves. He said, since they introduced them back into Yellowstone, they've gotten out, obviously they would, and they're just driving ranchers and everybody crazy, but it was taken down by a wolf. And I said, have you ever seen a wolf? And he said, you know what? Just last week, while we were riding, there was a wolf up on the ridge and it followed us the whole time. And he said, you know what he's doing? He's learning our habits. He's seeing what we're up to. I'm telling you, wolves are like demons. They're demons. They're watching your habits. They're observing you. And they're looking for a time when you're weak. I'll give you a perfect example. Luke chapter 4, after Satan tested Jesus in the wilderness, remember the temptation in the wilderness three times? After the third one, when Jesus withstood the temptation, it says in verse 13 of Luke chapter 4, Satan said, I will leave him and look for an opportune time. I'll come back. I'll find the right time and I'll come back. In the same way, I'm telling you, demons watch us, they study us, they look for the weak times when they can attack us. They can attack us. And by the way, do you know who they attack? <laughs> they attack isolated sheep. Um, people that are on the fringe. Think, think of it this way. Think of this, okay? This is like a sheepfold. You never think of rays like a sheepfold, okay? But this, this, is like, this is like a sheep pen here. So think of it this way. You are a sheep, and there's a wolf who is doing everything he can to get you. And this is what I tell people. I would make sure I'm not on the fringe. I'll tell you what, one of Satan's most effective uh ploys he has used is the number of Christians who, after not being able to go to church, and then as churches, us bending over backwards, which we needed to do to make it available in their home, have never gone back to church. They're like, why would I go? That's one of the reasons people kept seeing live stream this. I'm like, heck no. Get your lazy butt out of bed and come and, you know, be around other Christians. I'm not just going to sit here and talk to you at home while you have your coffee and your donuts. Come here and have your coffee and your donuts. Get fat with us here, right? But anyway, you don't want to be on the fringe. You don't want to be by yourself. You don't want to have one of those attitudes. If I have absolutely nothing else to do, I'm going to go to church. You know what? I got nothing to do today. I think I'll go to Bible study. If I were you, I would show up every week and I'd say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And I'd get right in the middle of the sheep pen, right? I would get as close to the shepherd as possible. But I would make sure I'm not on the fringe because I'm telling you, they attack on the fringe. So understand, demons really do exist. Demons really do enter people. Here's the third one. Jesus really does cast out demons. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, Jesus, remember the story? He sent out the 72 followers, not just the 12, but the 72. It says in chapter 10, verse 17, I got to wrap this up. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus basically replies, yeah, that doesn't really impress me. Verse 18, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the heaven. I'm not worried about Satan. But then he goes on and says this, I have given you authority to trample on snakes 
and scorpions. He's not talking about creepy crawlers, okay? He's talking about demons. And to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy, through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things. Remember these words. You have hidden these things from the wise and the learned. In other words, those who think they're so wise and so smart. You've hidden it from them and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. Go back and notice that phrase. I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven, because you have hidden these things. Now, what were they just talking about? They were talking about demons, having authority over demons. And Jesus said, I know there are a lot of people out there. They think they're so smart, so wise, so clever, so sophisticated. They don't believe in demons. But Jesus says, you know what? I thank you, Father, because these young believers do. They've seen it. They've witnessed it. They understand it. And I thank you for that. I want you to understand something. Satan knows that as Christians, most of us believe that if there are demons, God has the power over them, right? Satan knows that. He knows that we believe greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So what is Satan's best attack? Well, he, you know what he does? He attacks us with our weaknesses. He attacks us with our history. And he'll say things like some of you are sitting there today thinking what, whatever it is that you're struggling with, this is what Satan is saying to you. You can't get free. You can't get free. Other people can get free, but you can't get free because I have a stronghold in this area. You can't get free. And maybe some of you are thinking, I've tried, I just can't get free. Well, I want to remind you that in Mark chapter five, where we started, this man was demonized. Legion. We know he had at least 2,000 demons. He lived naked in the cemetery. So you may be in bondage this morning, but guess what? <laughs> you're not as in bondage as this guy. At least you got your clothes on. Right, at least you got your clothes on, so you're, you're way ahead of this guy. But I want you to see something that will encourage you. Mark chapter 5, verse 6 says this. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. In other words, he ran to Jesus and he worshiped him. This is what I, I want you to understand. This is what I want to leave you with. Satan does not have the power to keep you from coming to Jesus to find relief. Remember that. If he could have stopped anybody from going to Jesus, he could have stopped this guy. So let me just say that if, if you have that difficulty in your life, you can't seem to shake. If you, there's an area of sin that you can't stop and you just can't break it, you're probably in bondage in that area. You're, you're under the influence in that area. But what I want to leave you with is um, Jesus can set you free. And so next week we're going to talk about emotionally how does that happen. By the way, I... I train a guy, I do some personal training at the gym, and I train a guy, and I ran into him Tuesday night, and I noticed his finger was all bandaged up. And I said, Tony, what happened? He said, oh man, Jimmy Buffett died. I was trying to honor him by making some margaritas. And he said, I, I cut the tip of my finger off. I had to go in and get stitches and had it all wrapped up. Well, that was on Tuesday. He came into the gym on Friday for me to train him. I said, how's your finger feeling? He says, great. And I said, let me tell you the story about the time I cut off the tip of my finger. He just says, no, 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 no. Don't even talk about it. Don't even talk about it. He said, I can't even talk about it. If I, in fact, if I even saw the margarita machine, it made me want to throw it. I took the margarita machine and I took it to Dorcas and I gave it to Dorcas. And they said, that looks like a brand new machine. He says, it is, but it's bad and you can have it. He said, I, I didn't even want it in my house anymore. And I thought, that's how we handle demons. We acknowledge that it's bad. We get it out of our lives. But here's the key. We shut the door so they can't come back again. So next week, we're going to talk about how do you get free and how do you close the door? What do you got to go drop off at Dorcas? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you don't have to worry about it anymore. Father, thank you for being here with us today. And we do know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we do know that Satan has absolutely no authority, no power over any of us that we don't give him. But Father, maybe even without realizing it, we have given him entrances into our lives and we just need to take those back. We just need to take those back. So help us in this process, Father, to find freedom. Freedom from discouragement, freedom from bondage, freedom from that feel I'm just trapped and I can't get out of this situation. Because if we know the truth, 
the truth can set us free. But first we have to acknowledge that we need to be set free. So help us to get there. And Father, I can't wait to see what you're going to do in all of our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.